Hi, this is David Thornburg, President and CEO of the Committee of 70. Welcome to another installment of Studio C70, which is a, an occasional <laughs> series of Facebook Live uh, informational interviews that we do with folks both locally and around the country to talk about ways in which we can improve and strengthen our local representative democracy. And today we are again pleased to be joined by uh, City Commissioner Al Schmidt. Uh, Al, welcome again. Thanks for having me back, Dave. Uh, Al was uh, good enough to be on here a couple weeks ago and uh, has graciously uh, agreed to come back. And uh, if all goes according to plan, we'll do more of these in the future leading up to the, uh, to the November uh, election. And uh, I think we'll probably uh, uh, take special uh, topics for each one of these. And today is a really critical uh, topic that we're gonna talk about, which is poll workers. And if you've been tuning in to uh, some of the uh, previous uh, interviews we did both today and yesterday, uh, we talked to actual poll workers, folks that uh, have uh, served in what I think of as the uh, role of first responders of democracy and uh, the folks behind the table on election day uh, and who are making the whole thing work. So, uh, Al, I think you are a baseball fan and you remember maybe Mr. Cub, Ernie Banks, uh, at one point saying, it's a beautiful day, let's play two. So uh, <laughs> this is a, an election worker doubleheader that we're doing today and you're on yeah. the back half of the doubleheader. But let's, let's begin, uh, a thought occurred to me, have you ever worked the polls yourself? I did a long time ago in Fairmount in the 15th Ward. Uh, I think it was the 15th Ward 4th uh, Division. Good enough. Well, I did too, way back when, uh, in, when we first moved to Germantown. And uh, it was an instructive experience, so let's, let's uh, put it that way. Um, let's start with the big picture and talk about, we, we do poll workers differently in Pennsylvania than a lot of other states do, and there's some good news and some bad news about that, but to kind of paint the, the big picture of uh, how the Constitution dictates the way we manage polls and in-person elections. Whoops. Al, can you hear me? have to go on an extended solo here, I guess. This reminds me of the time when um, I was uh, had invited uh, Mayor Ed Rendell to speak in an event once, and uh, I was supposed to be introducing him, and as he was wont to do, uh, Ed was about 45 minutes late, so I had to <laughs> <laughs> Make up things to say for 45 minutes. <laughs> Dave, I hope you were just telling jokes or something for the there last There you were. I was uh, about to pull out the from slides for my summer vacation. Uh, okay, <laughs> back. But did, did you catch my question or do you want me to restart that? I, I didn't. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, just asking you to sort of paint the big picture of how we do uh, poll worker management in, in Pennsylvania, because we, we do things a little differently than they do in a lot of states. Uh, and there's some good news and some bad news about that. But if you could just sort of start there to sort of frame the puzzle for people. Well, election boards are the most critical piece of the election day uh, operation. On election day, the city commissioners don't matter very much, it's your local election board, your local judge of elections, majority inspector, minority inspector, clerk, and machine operator, uh, who are your neighbors uh, from the area, ideally working your board. And it's set up to be, you know, bipartisan. Election day, success on election day, uh, comes down to whether that board is able to um, with our assistance, operate, and every voter can vote and vote unobstructed, um, ideally. To behold it from kind of headquarters is a breathtaking 
thing to see. We normally have, in a normal election, around 8,000 people, essentially volunteers. We pay them. They don't work for us, but we pay them um, to serve on election day. 8,000 people showing up at 6.30 in the morning to work for, you know, 14 hours in the course of the day to get election day done. It is, as you said in some previous interview, creaky and, you described it as creaky and, um, can't remember my own words. Let's just creepy go and something or other, but but that's it. Like it's it's really very primitive and very basic um, that that's able to to happen. And again, it all sort of comes down to your neighbors. All those election board workers are um, are elected every four years. They or they're if they're not elected and there's a vacancy, they're appointed to those positions. Or um, if they don't have that. They're, they're uh, elected on the spot that election day morning, uh, which is an incredible thing to see going on at more than 1,700 precincts or divisions across the city. Yeah. The fact that you just pointed out, I think, is lost on most, fo most folks that they are, these workers are, in fact, elected. It's not just uh, Al Schmidt and the other commissioners rounding up people or soliciting volunteers and so forth. That does bring with it some particular challenges. It does. Um, like we said, we can't hire them, we can't fire them. So if the judge of elections that got elected is uh, a bum and he shows up late or he's rude to voters or things like that, we can't just fire them. If they are doing something that is obstructing the election, we contact the district attorney's office to see what recourse we have to get them removed on election day, but they're elected, just like the other commissioners and I are elected um, to serve in those roles, you know, on election day. And just to clarify, is that embedded in the state election code or actually in the constitution of the Commonwealth? It's, it's in the constitution. Yeah. Um, and they serve those roles for, they're elected for four-year terms, uh, and they obviously run every every four years. Ideally, you have uh, positions for both or more than two parties on the election board. So you have checks and balances in place. So you sort of alluded to this, but give folks a sense of what things look like, uh, let's say at uh, 710 on an election morning in a busy election. Mm -hmm. Uh, around poll workers? Are you getting calls from all over the place that Sarah didn't show up and D Darlene overslept? And what's it look like? We, with a city this size, with, like I said, more than 1,700 precincts operating in normally 830 or 40 polling locations, every manner of thing occurs overnight. And I think I mentioned to you the other day, you know, sometimes a polling place gets flooded. Sometimes there's a water main break out front. Sometimes it becomes a crime scene. Sometimes the janitor doesn't show up at six o'clock in the morning to open the building. Like every possible thing um, happens in a, in a city of, of this size. Um, and the word, actually, I, I wrote it down that you used the other day, was creaky and fragile because it, it, it really is. Like there are so many different variables that could happen. And, you know, these people serving on the board um, work very hard and their neighbors. And while we don't normally see like a partisan conflict on election day, we see other conflicts. We, we see what uh, the district attorney's office sometimes refers to as Hatfield and McCoy problems. Some neighbor on the, somebody on the board is mad at some other person on the board because their dog was, you know, on their lawn or something like that. And these are the, these are the very glamorous things that we deal with <laughs> in, in elect, on, on election morning, yeah. whether we have those board staffed or not. This being Philadelphia, it probably involves somebody stealing somebody else's parking spot. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, there's nothing like those, those issues. The other peculiar thing about, uh, about the way that the structure of election workers is that 
with the exception of this past June, <clears throat> um, the election board workers have to serve right in the uh, divisions in which they live, right? Yeah, um, at least the uh, judge majority and you know minority have to, and that's very limiting because our divisions or precincts are very small. They're less than 1,200 people. Ideally, some are slightly in excess of that, but they're all, like I said before, neighbors. These are neighbors working those election boards. And um, you have a limited group of people to draw from. So starting in around 2015, we put together a small army of uh, people we hired just for the day uh, and a fleet of vehicles. So when we got calls from that point forward where boards were not able to stand up, they didn't have anybody, we could dispatch our people um, to stand up those boards so voting could at least begin until we were able to get additional, additional people to fill those roles. Again, if that board isn't there, if those election board workers aren't working, voters can't vote. It's really that, that simple and it's that critical. Creaky and fragile. Yeah. So I, I mentioned June. Uh, a lot of rules of the game were different in June, including the fact that you could uh, allow people to serve. I mean, we only had, what, 190 polling locations open? We did. And, and, and normally we have about 8,000 8, election board workers. And in June, we had around 26 to 2,700. Yeah. So the, the rules around uh, who could serve where were temporarily relaxed. So, for instance, I was talking to Ryan Godfrey earlier, who yeah. lives in West Philly, but he was able to uh, work at a poll in South Philly. So that that was was different in uh, in June, right? Yeah, it it was uh, because of legislation in Harrisburg. It loosened up a lot of those uh, restrictions to make sure that we could stand up polling places and uh, and election boards to make election day happen. Yeah. So there was, rightfully so, a lot of focus uh, around the mail ballots in, uh, in, in June, because about half the votes, I think, that came in, came in through the mails or through the drop boxes or uh, publicized by the Volkswagen. Um, but focusing on, on poll workers, what is your and your colleagues' assessment of how well that worked on June 2nd, the in-person voting recruitment and training of poll workers? Well, we were not able to train the election board workers for June 2nd, the way that we traditionally do uh, through classes. We had our presentation on our website. We had the handbook on our website. We had a video about how to use the voting machine on our website and other resources on our website in the election board worker section. Um, but we were not able to train them the way that we typically do. And, you know, over, over time, it's, it's, it's funny being, being in this role because public service is really a what have you done for me lately thing. But since coming in in 2012, we have uh, revamped the entire election board training process. Um, and we still have a way to go, but you know, after I came into office in 2012, we were able to begin posting all the training materials um, on the website. We were able to post who the election board workers even were on the website. So you would know, hey, is there a vacancy? When I'm in the first ward, first division, do they need people? Do they not need people? So we were able to, you know, post that. We created in 2014 election board worker unit um, that began recruiting election boards, that began calling through. We created a PowerPoint presentation. Um, before I came in, you, it, it just was, some of the older election board workers might know, actually older, it's not that long ago, but it was like a newspaper sort of guide. So this is a PowerPoint presentation and election board worker handbook with an index, and we begin, began increasing the pay uh, in $5 increments for, um, for training. Began, like I said, calling through all the election boards to find out if they need vacancies or not. Began recruiting election board um, machine inspectors. 
in two ways. One was after all this time on the back of uh, the uh, voter registration form, they added a little question saying, hey, would you like to serve on your local election board? And machine inspectors don't need to work in their home division. They can work anywhere. And those so we are began, positions that you appoint, right? Uh, yeah, we can appoint them. We appoint those. Um, so we began calling through those to recruit those to fill um, vacancies and also having a portal on our website for people to apply. Um, and then really, you know, one problem running through all this is that this is a very long day. And in a presidential election year, it's so busy from beginning, beginning to end, which makes it pretty difficult. In a non-presidential election year, like a DA controller cycle, um, it's also a difficult day because you don't have as many people. You have different problems. You have fewer election boards showing up to work than you do in like a presidential election. So pay was really critical. And while we were able to do two $5 increases for training uh, in, I think, 2014, 2015, um, Commissioner Dealey was able to get us a, a $20 increase for the election board workers across the board in the city, um, starting in, I believe, the end of 2018. And that was really critical. You had a, a guest uh, on yesterday, Kate, and I'm very grateful for her, for her service, and I agree with everything that she said. And in her experience, a lot of people, they don't do it for the pay. They do it because of civic virtue. They do it because they care and they want to be able to make sure their neighbors vote. But a lot of Philadelphians do do it for that pay. Yeah. You know, $100 or $200 may not be a lot to some people, but it is groceries for a month for seniors uh, and a lot of our election board workers on fixed incomes. Yeah. It is rent for a month. It is you know, gifts for their children and grandchildren uh, at the end of the year around the holidays for working on election day in early November. So a lot of people do, you know, they, they all take it seriously, but you know, some of them do do that because of the, the pay. And we were able to increase that uh, thanks to Commissioner Dealey getting an appropriation from uh, city council at the end of 2018. Yeah. We uh, wanna encourage folks, if you're watching this live on Facebook, if you'd like to ask a question to Commissioner Schmidt, uh, just post it uh, on the page. And we've got a very clever, I hope, way of relaying those questions to me. So we actually just had, had one that, come, that, that came in. And um, the question is, what if someone ends up working in a precinct where they don't live? Uh, could this be an issue in November if the legislature doesn't reauthorize the relaxed rules? Does it, I mean, I, that, that must come up even in non-pandemic uh, times, but what, what do you do about that? It, it does, and it was, it was something that was never enforced uh, until maybe six or seven years ago. And it was when election board workers were charged with either voter fraud or election fraud that the prosecutors threw in, oh, by the way, they're also not working in their home division. So that was a concern for us that it was gonna, you know, ultimately on election day, we want election, we want voters to be able to vote, period. Um, but the, the prosecutors began throwing in um, that, the people who were doing other things also weren't working in their home division. So it had a little bit of a, I don't know what the right expression is, but a little bit of like a chilling effect. Yeah. Um, because a lot of those boards are operational because uh, people show up to vote, uh, show up to work on election day, and they may not be from that home division. You have a gymnasium, and you have a election board over here, and you have an election board over here. And this one has eight people, and this one has none. On election day, you know, we want that other board to stand up the, the vacant board so voters can vote. Yeah. Let's take the back half of that question as a lead into uh, a, another set of issues, which is uh, trying to anticipate what the in-person voting experience is going to be like in November, and particularly how you're thinking now as of July 14th 
about uh, the availability of poll workers. If, if you have to stand up all 850 or whatever it is, uh, polling locations, or if you go to 200 or somewhere in between. So how are you and your colleagues thinking about that right now? So our goal right now is to make the November election as close to a regular election as possible. That being said, we will still lose all of our senior centers as polling places, and we will lose all of our firehouses, and we'll lose other locations as polling places. So really the goal is to have as many polling places open as possible, because the whole point of all this is to not have more people in fewer places. Uh, and with a little bit of lead time like we have now, unlike in the spring, um, even though it's changing day to day, obviously there were announcements today about the rest of the year uh, for public events and other things. The goal is to make election day, the in-person voting experience as close to um, uh, normal as, as possible. And how does, again, I, I know it's hard to look into the future 99 days or I think that's where we are right now. Who's counting? Um, but what, what, what would you guess about the availability of poll workers if in fact you, we have to staff a full complement of, of voting locations? Is, is that possible? Um, whether we're going to have, you know, we're not going to have 830 locations with 8,000 uh, election board workers. That's really not going to happen. But our election board unit is reaching out to all the election board workers who have worked in the past or will be, whether they worked this last primary or, um, or not. And certainly if people would like to work on election day, they should reach out to us uh, and we will make sure that, um, that there are opportunities for them to work on the on election day as close to their home, you know, location as possible. Um, it is difficult to, you know, when you're in this role, sometimes election day seems near and far at the same time. From a planning perspective, it's very near. Yeah. From a uh, look in a crystal ball perspective or fortune telling or what a future um, prediction, it's it's very challenging not knowing what the situation is going to be like in November. Actually, you reminded me there's a critical bit of information that I, I hope you can share with folks, which is what do you do if, right now if you want to work at the polls on, uh, uh, on November 3rd? So there's a couple things. If you go to our website, which is philadelphiavotes.com, you'll see uh, a, a couple of tabs at the top. One of those is uh, the election board tab where all the training is and all the other things are located. You can also uh, see who the elected or court appointed election board workers are in your uh, home division, uh, whether they're vacancies or not. You can also call our offices, our information is on the website to look up to see if those boards have been staffed at full capacity uh, in the past. And there's also a link to, um, to serve as a, a machine inspector uh, to work the machines on uh, on election day. And we can obviously have people work anywhere in the city, regardless yeah. of their home division for that. So right now, if, if a voter is, uh, is inspired to want to serve on November 3rd, they go through that. You, you have their name on a list that the easiest appointment you can make is for, uh, is for, uh, the machine inspectors, right? Because those are your, your picks. But then otherwise people are placed into a pool that at, at the last minute in the last week, you get a call and say, you know, essentially, can we do these, one of these sort of last minute elections, I guess, right? Yeah, well, we have, we have an election board unit that is essentially tracking more than 1700 precincts, like I said, or divisions in the city. Um, so a judge of elections may call up a week before the election and say, um, my minority inspector broke her leg. Right. Um, and her husband, who's the clerk, is uh, going to stay home with her. So we just lose two people. So we're trying to keep track of 8,000 volunteers citywide. We have the ability to do five-day appointments. Uh, 
in the last five days before Election Day to fill any vacancy uh, in the city with registered voters from Philadelphia. It's it's like a big macro appointment of people um, to make sure they're to make sure they don't get in trouble for working in a location other than their home division. We're able to appoint them um, to fill those vacancies in the in the last five days. Yeah. Um, but we have an election board unit that's that you know tries to track all of this stuff, to track the vacancies, to call the judge of elections, to make sure that the boards are going to be full. Yeah. So we've just got a couple minutes left. I want to leave you with uh, we we talk, I asked you last time for your uh, your letter to Santa Claus, uh, <laughs> what you what you hoped might happen, and some other aspects of the election. But rephrase a little bit. Um, what, what would you, what are, what are your and your fellow commissioners like three key priorities around uh, poll workers and as it relates to the in-person election that, that you have to get accomplished between now and, and November 3rd? That, that's within your control, not just, gee, I wish the legislature would do something or the... Yeah, so we're so we're not we're not uh, there's no letter to Santa here, as as you put it. So with there's, no, there's no Santa Claus and there's no uh, tooth fairy. <laughs> so uh, within our control, to some degree, is identifying and inspecting uh, possible polling places, because like I mentioned, we lost a lot of them. We're going to lose a lot of them, um, but we want to have as many as possible. And it's, it's not like we can just say, oh, you know, this garage, we can use that. We have to send out inspectors to make sure that they're wheelchair accessible, to make sure there's enough space inside of them for the election boards, for the voting machines, and for the voters to vote on election day. And that's even more of a priority now because of the, you know, COVID uh, situation of space. Um, uh, so making sure that we have locations and making sure that we have election boards and calling through, like I said, people who worked in the past, calling through all the judges of elections to, to make sure that we're gonna have polling places and polling places that are staffed on election day. Those are under our control to the extent that there's something we can do about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing is like Ryan Godfrey mentioned in the last interview, everybody who votes by mail is one fewer voter showing up on election day, you know, standing in line and adding to the election day pressure on the poll workers and the, the polling places. So we wanna make sure that people are able to apply to vote by mail and to turn around their ballots um, uh, expeditiously to get them out to them so they can get them back to us before election day and have you know confidence that their vote was cast. Yeah, good. So let me summarize your three points. One is uh, polling locations. Uh, two is uh, care feeding, recruitment, and uh, <laughs> building relationships with uh, poll workers. Uh, and then the third, frankly, is another way of looking at, as you said, mail voting is relieving the, the pressure, the, uh, the November 3rd pressure on, on polling locations. Because as you said, every voter that votes uh, at home is, is one uh, less voter that, that shows up in the poll. So uh, let's leave it at that. That sounds like plenty of uh, <laughs> challenge for you. <laughs> well, yeah, well, we have to, you have to keep things to three because otherwise uh, it starts to be too, uh, uh, too daunting. But you know, it's uh, funny. You asked me, you asked me in the last interview about my experience at um, when I was a senior auditor, a performance auditor at the, United States Government Accountability Office, and every audit we ever did had three points. Like it was, lo and behold, you could be auditing a uh, defense weapons system program, or you could be auditing some, you know, um, uh, federal subsidies for you know milk production or something like that. Lo and behold, it's always three three bullet points every single time. I could go, I could go into an extended riff on that as, as <laughs> members of the Committee of 70 staff could tell you, but we'll leave that for another time. Um, thanks again for joining us. And uh, I'm sure we'll be uh, talking to you maybe in a few weeks and uh, best of luck in the interim. Great. Thank you, David.